I'd like to also acknowledge the uh, traditional owners. I want to acknowledge Steve and, and Andrew, I think, who presented before, and of course all of you for uh, addressing what's such a critical issue. Um, if we're going to if we're going to meet the needs of people with very complex health, medical, family, housing, education issues, a, a raft of issues, then we've got to have a radical rethink about the way we deliver services to people. I think that's the first thing to, to say. Um, we've got an incredibly fragmented system. It starts here, and you heard, I think, from Stephen, we've got a very silo-driven approach to handing out buckets of money, and when you hand out buckets of money in that way, then what you do is you actually create the silos at the service delivery level, and that's part of the challenge we've got. In primary care, we've got a hugely fragmented system where we've got general practice, allied health professionals, we've got hospitals sitting over here, uh, we've got mental health over there, and the parts of the system just don't talk to each other in the way that they should. And of course, then you add uh, welfare and the issues of income support, again, separate from uh, primary care. You look at the huge challenges we've got in terms of the ageing uh, population, the sort of expanding um, you know, burgeoning problem of chronic disease and how we're going to be able to manage to um, adequately address all of those issues through the current system. And you know we've got a massive problem. We've got workforce issues, we've got growing inequality, we've got problems with out-of-pocket expenses. Um, we have some huge issues uh, to face in, in this area. Um, but one thing you don't do is you don't address those issues um, by creating a sense of panic around uh, the cost of the system and a sense of panic that's completely unjustified. And you don't use the budget as a blunt tool to um, take us in precisely the opposite direction that we need to be heading in this area. And that's where we're going. We are going full speed in the opposite direction uh, to the direction we need to be going to address uh, some of these issues. Uh, let's, let's put, and I think Stephen addressed the issue of health spending, let's put the problem in, in context. I don't know if, I suspect many of you will have seen the Commonwealth Fund's recent health report that compares us, our health system, with other countries. And actually, we do pretty well. We do pretty well. We've got, a, a, in their words, a very efficient health system, delivers relatively strong health outcomes. On OECD figures, our life expectancy is pretty good, better than most countries except a, a handful. Um, our level of health expenditure is much lower than most other OECD countries uh, as a proportion of GDP. And Australians generally are very satisfied with the health care they get. So you take a step back, we've got some big problems we have to address, but the fundamentals are still uh, pretty good. Our proportion of GDP spent on health is low, it's stable, it's about 9% of total spending of GDP on health. And as Stephen said, the amount we spend on Medicare is stable, and if, if anything, it's heading down. That's not a crisis. If you project forwards and look over the next 10 years, we're probably going to increase our proportion of GDP spent on health, maybe a percent or so. But that's largely driven, and this is um, some work done by the Grattan Institute, it's lar largely driven by access to new health technologies, new medicines, new diagnostic uh, procedures, new treatments. That's a good thing. I mean, isn't that the whole point? The whole point of having a GDP, I mean, if you look at the profile of developing countries as they develop, as they industrialise, they spend more of um, their GDP on healthcare. That's the whole point of becoming a wealthy, wealthy, prosperous, developed nation. And individuals do it as well. As you become wealthier, you're able to spend more on your health. And the trajectory is good. We're heading potentially for a small increase in GDP on health, because we've got access to these new treatments. If that's a crisis, you know, um, a lot of countries would give their right arm to have the same crisis we're having, giving people access to new treatments that help them live longer, healthier lives. So let's, let's get it in context. We're very, we, we don't only get the balance right between um, spending, um, but fairness as well. We've got a very good balance, and particularly in primary care the balance is becoming uh, out of whack and it's, it's become, we've got some issues we need to address. As I said, this rising problem of out-of-pocket costs. And when you look at the Commonwealth Funds report, it was that area that Australia fell down badly, the issue of out-of-pocket costs relative to other countries. But we've generally got that, that balance right, the balance between fairness and having a very efficient system. We do it because we've got Medicare, a single insurer, 
that's able to set prices, that gives everybody equal access, and that ensures that prices aren't being set by the providers of health services. So we've actually got a very efficient way of managing um, costs in healthcare. But as I said, we do have some challenges. We know out-of-pocket costs are increasing. Independently of this budget, a few months before the budget, I referred to a Senate inquiry, the issue of out-of-pocket healthcare costs. And we've received submissions from some of you in this room. We'll be holding hearings and we plan to look at that issue in much more detail. But the budget has really put the spotlight on that specific issue. As I said, the coordination of services, the fragmentation in the system. Um, we've got this enormous problem with workforce distribution that we need to address. Um, we've got to move to a much more efficient, of, uh, efficient um, system for sharing information, and eHealth um, has um, uh, some promise in that area. And of course, there's dental health, one of the great failures of the system and something that I've worked very hard to address, um, a, a huge problem. When it comes to the welfare side of the equation, again, we've got a very well-targeted welfare system. I mean, this mythology that there is this huge problem with um, people sitting at home, drinking, smoking, bludging off the system, I mean, that's last century thinking. It's become much harder over successive decades for people to get access to decent income support. If you look at um, our system, Joe Hockey recently trumpeted the idea that, well, 20% of um, uh, the lowest 20% of, of Australians um, receive one of the highest levels of income support anywhere in the world. And for him, that was a bad thing. That's actually a sign of the system working. We want our system to be targeted at those people most in need. And in fact, if you look at people on median incomes, on average incomes, they are one of the lowest beneficiaries of welfare anywhere in the world. So our system works, it's highly targeted. If anything, the big problem there is the sort of support that we offer those people is so low that it condemns them to uh, a life of poverty. So we are going in the opposite direction. We're doing that at a rate of knots and we're missing all of the key challenges in this area. Um, one of the things I'm really concerned about is now one of the pillars of our primary health care system, and that is that everybody can see a GP, no matter um, how wealthy they are or not, because your Medicare card is still the most important bit of plastic you've got in your wallet. Well, there's now a trend, and, and I think there's some very worrying signs about the growing role of private health insurance in the uh, general practice um, environment. What we're going to see now is we've got a trial in Queensland where Medibank Private are offering a service to a number of um, private, a uh, number of GPs, where they um, have struck a deal, um, sailing very close to the law as it currently stands, that allows them to provide services to their clients who are um, uh, patients of a particular general practice. Um, the next step there is that we have a, a much bigger role for GP, uh, for private health insurance in a general practice, and we very much end up with this two-tiered system whereby um, one, people, uh, one group of people get level, uh, a level of access and treatment uh, to, um, uh, th that's denied to people who simply can't afford it. And that's, that's, that undermines that key principle of fairness and universality that currently exists. But more than that, it makes the system, again, less efficient and more expensive because delivering primary care services through a system of competing private health insurers um, is a recipe for spiralling uh, um, health insurance premiums and much more expensive service delivery. It's the wrong way to go and we need to uh, ensure that we do everything we can uh, to stop it. So the direction we're going is going to, it will do two things. It will make the system much more difficult for people with complex needs who need to access services, but it will make the system much more ex expensive. And the, the sort of, I think Stephen said before, this idea that there's, there are too many people visiting a doctor. Um, th there's no evidence of it. I mean, I, s I stood there before the, as the chair of the Commission of Audit Inquiry, um, asking questions of uh, Tony Shepherd. Where is the evidence that, that over-servicing is a real problem in general practice? There isn't any. It is a deeply ideological um, view that says um, the only way that we're going to have a much more efficient system is to introduce a price signal that will cause people to second-guess whether they see a doctor. Well, if you're someone who's at home um, 
and you're um, struggling to find a job, you're on income support, uh, you've got a number of health issues, you've got some kids who might have been sick last week who you've taken to the doctor and you've got chest pain and you're thinking, do I go and visit the GP? I, I'm going to struggle to pay the rent this week. I'll give it a miss. It's probably indigestion. And it lands you in hospital because you're actually suffering from a heart attack. I mean, that, that is the impact of a co-payment. A co-payment will deter some people who might not need to go and see a doctor. That's true. But it's a very blunt instrument and it will deter those people who need to see a doctor and who, as a consequence of that visit, will avoid ending up in a much more expensive hospital. And one of the great challenges in health we've got at the moment is keeping people away from hospital, having much more engagement in primary care, expanding the role of all the health professionals that work in that space, linking them up and ensuring that a person doesn't have to navigate their way through this maze of complexity that exists in the system as it currently stands. That is where we've got some of the great challenges and where we need to be heading. Uh, in welfare, we're now looking at a work for the Dole scheme. And I, I, know, I heard Andrew, but um, there is not a shred of evidence that suggests that people who engage in work for the Dole are more likely to end up in long-term employment. In fact, the evidence goes, again, in the opposite direction. Um, Professor Borland from Melbourne Uni, who's um, done some very good work on this, suggests you're much less likely to end up in employment if you've been in a work for the Dole scheme. I mean, at a superficial level, it sounds good. Maybe you learn a little bit about waking up on time and the discipline of um, attending a job um, and all of the things that mean that you're more likely to be employable down the track, but it's just not borne out by the evidence. And in the end, if we're not going to be guided by the evidence, then we shouldn't be here. Um, the other thing, of course, is I, I think back to my experience as a, as a GP. I, mean, I think most of you know that I've worked in, um, uh, uh, in general practice and, and in public health. I spent some time as a drug and alcohol um, clinician. And I just think of the case study of, of the young woman who um, has chronic anxiety, who is heroin dependent and seeing me because she needs her methadone regularly, who might have asthma, might be on the oral contraceptive pill, his partner might have been in jail. And I think, let's look at the package of reforms that we've just seen introduced and what they mean for that person. What they mean for that person. This is somebody who will now be confronted with a co-payment to come and see me simply to get the medication that keeps her uh, well. This is somebody who's going to be faced with a co-payment when she needs a blood test to do the monitoring that's necessary to make sure that, we've, um, that, that she's benefiting from her treatment somebody who's going to need a co-payment when she goes and get her, gets her script filled for the oral contraceptive pill, somebody who's going to need a co-payment when she visits um, uh, a mental health professional, it's somebody who's going to need a co-payment when she needs to pay for her asthma medication and her oral contraceptive pill. How on earth do we expect that person to stay healthy? And you know what the alternative is? And it's I mean, I don't want to sound alarmist, but the alternative is pretty straightforward. If you've got chronic anxiety and you've had a problem with heroin, you'll go back to heroin, and the only way you'll go back to heroin is you'll start dealing again. It's the only way you can maintain a habit if you've got a serious heroin problem. That's the consequence. Criminality, um, blood-borne viruses, and all of the things that go along with having substance dependence. This is a budget that takes us absolutely in the opposite direction to where we need to be heading. Um, I don't like sounding particularly partisan at these meetings. I, I, I try and avoid that when I can. But if ever there was a declaration from a government about where its priorities lie, where its priorities lie and um, the sort of people that it intends to target through a deeply um, ideological and very narrow view of how we improve our health and welfare system, this is it. This is the budget. And I can tell you, I am going to be doing everything I can uh, in the Senate to ensure that we don't see um, some of the changes that have been proposed in this budget. And we'll be fighting very hard to ensure that that young woman who has all those problems and now has been kicked off income support, doesn't become homeless, um, dependent, uh, at once again on heroin, um, and potentially all the impacts that it has on her kids and the environment that they're growing up in. So uh, we're gonna be fighting very, very hard to reverse what we think is a very unfair and by its own measure, a deeply inefficient way of addressing some of the challenges we've got in health and welfare. So I'll leave it there and take some questions.
Thank Thanks. you so much.